Hi, fourth graders. We're continuing our read and almost finished with Out of My Shell. And we are beginning today on page um, 163, 163 at the top of the page. And they're in a place where they have just um, completed, I'll call it their search for the turtles that did not make it to the ocean. So I think I'll go back to the bottom of page 162. There, the last paragraph on 162 and, and begin there. We searched the dunes for several more hours, but only came across one more hatchling. When we set them free, Sarah demonstrated where to release the baby turtles. She turned them toward the ocean and placed them not quite in the surf. One by one, the hatchlings, with heads so big they seemed wobbly, scrambled across the sand with fierce determination. They no longer seemed exhausted as they raced for the sea and got tossed by the first few waves. I found myself whispering a prayer as the ocean gobbled each one of them whole. Only one in a thousand makes it to adulthood, Sarah said, and I was reminded of Dad saying the exact same thing. They still have a rough road ahead of them. They'll have to escape predators and fishermen, but their chances for, su for survival just got a whole lot better, thanks to you. Mom wrapped her arm around my shoulder and squeezed, moved by what we'd just been a part of. I settled into her embrace. Sarah gave us the number for the island's turtle watch before she left. If you stumble across another nest, they'll mark it off and keep it monitored. It's run by volunteers. You two might think about joining. You already have experience. Oh, and they also walk the beach once a week to check for any lighting ordinance violations. Something about what Sarah said nagged at me as mom and I walked back to the beach house. But I was so jazzed about saving the hatchlings that I couldn't concentrate. And then mom said, that was amazing. You did great. Thanks, I said, and I felt great. All afternoon, my mind kept replaying the image of the rescued hatchlings racing for the waves. Every time I pictured their flippers slapping the sand, I smiled to myself and my heart hummed a happy tune. Lainey and my grandparents still weren't back when my stomach started growling for food. They're staying for the parade, Mom informed me. Grandma called a little bit ago. I guess we're on our own for dinner. I felt a tug pulling me back, telling me to retreat into my room again. Mom and me sharing a meal, just the two of us? No, thank you. But then I thought of the way she'd sprung into action when I needed her help, and I figured it might not be that bad. We decided to order a pizza. What kind do you want? I asked. You know, I'm not sure, Mom laughed, but it didn't sound like a laugh. It sounded sad and hollow. I've forgotten what I like. Back home, we always ordered a cheese pizza because that was mine and Lainey's favorite, and a sausage and black olive because that's what Dad liked. We finally settled on half cheese for me, half ham and green pepper for mom. It was too awkward to wait in the same room as mom for the pizza to arrive. But after the doorbell rang and I followed my nose back to the kitchen, I found the table set for two. As much as I wanted to grab a few slices and ghost, the thought of mom eating alone at the nearby set table was too depressing. She smiled when I slid into the seat next to hers. I hope Lainey isn't wearing your grandparents out, she confided in me. She's a bit spirited and they're old. I offered. Mom laughed, a sincere laugh this time. I was looking for a politer way to phrase it, but yeah, they're old. Your sister wears me out sometimes. Me too, I said. I could probably count on one hand the number of times Mom and I had spent an evening together. Just her and me. It might happen more often now. What would that be like? It's not like Dad had ever missed a dinner with the family, had never missed a dinner with the family. But the house would feel so much emptier without his coffee mug set out for breakfast in the next day or his sweater hanging on the coat rack. Even when he wasn't there, there had always been reminders of him everywhere. He'd probably cleared those things out weeks ago. That was the plan. He'd finished moving out while we were in Florida and while he was on break between semesters. I pictured the empty side of his and mom's closet and all the books missing from the office shelves. Thinking about home made my throat feel tight. But now that the nest had hatched and there was no, what was there to distract me from thoughts of dad and my family's future? 
I felt an urgent need to leave the suffocating space inside the kitchen with my mother. Out on the beach, I knew I'd feel better. Hmm, I hesitated. Leaving abruptly didn't seem right, but I hadn't asked for permission to go outside a single time all summer. I'm done eating. I was thinking I'd go. I trailed off. Mom's mouth twisted into an unreadable expression. She sighed and nodded her head. Sure, she said. Just be careful out there. There's a high riptide warning for tonight. Stay out of the water. I began to leave. As an afterthought, I turned and said, thanks, Mom. Thanks for helping me rescue the hatchlings and for dinner and for not making a fuss over me going to the beach after dark. She got a sappy, far-off look on her face like me showing a little gratitude might make her cry. So I sped out of there like a hatchling racing for the water. The usual breeze was far more than a breeze that night. It lifted my hair and each blast felt gritty, pelting my skin with sand. I darted for the sheltered space between my dunes. The beachcomber had been gnawing at my thoughts all day. I knew exactly why those baby turtles had become disoriented and headed the wrong direction. Then there was what Sarah had said about the turtle watch keeping an eye out for lighting violations. But it made me so mad I couldn't bear to think about it. I focused instead on the fact that we'd found the hatchlings. I combed my fingers through the sand, expecting to find a piece of sea glass, but came up empty. It bugged me that one wasn't there. A mermaid tear had always been waiting for me. I still wasn't sure where they were coming from, but I'd come to expect them. I wanted another to add to my collection. Scooting to my hands and knees, I scoured the sound surrounding area. When I didn't find the piece of sea glass in the sand, I moved to the grassy area just beyond. It wasn't long before my hands located something unusual in the weeds. I recoiled at the touch. It wasn't the smooth, cool, hard texture of glass that I'd, hidden, I'd anticipated. Whatever it was, it was much larger than a mermaid tear, bumpy and squishy too. I quickly spread the grasses apart. In the moonlight, I made out the oblong shape of a tiny shell. But unlike the other hatchlings, when I lifted the sweet, this sweet baby turtle in my hand, his too large head drooped and his flippers hung at his side. My heart shattered. We'd missed one. And for this little guy, it was too late. The day's heat had been too much. He was gone. I lifted my head. My razor sharp line of sight zoomed in on the beach com comer. I breathed in steeply through my nose. My chin quivered, my eyes stung, my chest heaved and ached. The poor hatchling was dead and it was all Mr. Shaw's fault. We're going to stop there, and next time we'll begin on page 169, chapter 19. Thanks so much, fourth graders. Take care of yourselves. Bye.